Good day, everyone. I'm Dr. Pallavi Bhatt. I'm a former DNB resident in the Department of Radio Diagnosis, Holy Spirit Hospital in Mumbai. And today I will be presenting an interesting case under the guidance of our HOD, Dr. Shampa Brahmachari. It is about a usual complication, but in an unusual organ. So we had a 70-year-old female presented with complaints of lower abdominal pain and foul smelling vaginal discharge for just two days. She was initially suggested an abdominal ultrasound. We have a few ultrasound images here. What we could see were hypericoid foci with shadowing filling the endometrial cavity. It could be air, and there was air in the endometrial cavity as well as the upper vagina. And we could also see a suspicious streak of hypericoid foci, which could be air in the posterior uterine wall as well. So we're thinking about what could cause this. There was no obvious uterine mass. There was no endometrial thickening or any collection around the uterus or inside. There was no recent history of instrumentation which could explain the, which could introduce the air in the endometrial cavity or even cause uterine injury. The patient also did not have any fever uh, which could uh, explain an infective pathology. She also did not have any bowel-related complaints, but the possibility of an enterouterine fistula was raised. An infective pathology, which could result in grass formation, was deemed to be less likely. She was suggested uh, a computed tomography or a CT for further clarification of the pathology. She also later underwent an MRI as part of preoperative assessment. We have a few CT images here. We have the axial and uh, coronal images, which uh, show irregular circumferential thickening of the sylmoid colon. There is surrounding fat stranding and loss of fat plane with the posterior aspect of uterus. We can see air within the endometrial cavity. In the sagittal reformated images, we can see that the air in the endometrial cavity is actually communicating with with the lumen of the bowel, specifically at the rectosigmoid junction. There is a clear defect in the posterior uterine wall, which measured about 0.5 to a maximum of one centimeter. This was a colouterine fistula, and it was secondary to a malignancy. And with majority of the signs centering around the colon, uh, we could say that it was a colonic malignancy rather than a uterine malignancy. In the MRI, we have sagittal T2 images which confirmed our findings showing circumferential transmural thickening of the rectosigmoid junction. It measured about 19 mm and was seen about 12 cm from the anal canal. There was a lateral exophytic component uh, towards the left side, which contiguous, contiguously invades the uterine wall. At the time of MRI examination, there were multiple small air pockets as well. We also have uh, actual and sagittal T2 stir images, which show diffuse stir hyperintense soft tissue edema in pararectal and parametrial regions. And there was nodularity as well, which later turned out to be enlarged lymph nodes. Initially, the patient underwent a colonoscopy with biopsy of uh, visible growth at the rectosigmoid junction, which revealed moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma, which was not surprising. She underwent a radical sigmoidectomy and hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. Histopathology confirmed moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma of sigmoid colon and rectum, infiltrating the serosa as well as the myometrium, which was a pathological T4B. So what do we know about colorectal carcinoma? It's a relatively common cancer. In India, the annual incidence rates for colon cancer are 4.4 and 3.9 for one lakh men and women respectively. Five year survival rate of colorectal cancer in India is one of the lowest in the world at less than 40%. Accurate staging is essential for determining the optimal treatment strategies and planning appropriate surgical procedures. Ultrasound is commonly the initial screening modality based on the presentation. CT is used to evaluate distant metastasis 
while MRI is used for to evaluate local regional extension to assess the circumferential ejection margin available. The risk of recurrence and optimal therapeutic strategy also depend on MRI. Complications of colorectal cancer include obstruction, perforation, abscess formation, ischemic colitis, interception, and we see here fistula formation. What we see here is a colon uterine fistula, which is very rare, mostly secondary to colonic diverticulitis, but other causes can include malignancy or radiotherapy or even iotrogenic, mostly due to insertion of intrauterine devices or endometrial curatage causing uterine and bowel perforation. Obstetrical injuries can also cause a fistula. It should always be suspected when patient presents with malodorous discharge from the vagina. It can be diagnosed by air and fluid within the uterus on ultrasound or CT scan. However, a CT scan is essential after an ultrasound for an accurate preoperative assessment. Surgical treatment is indicated in almost all patients except in very high risk cases. So these fistulas which are associated with colon most commonly involve the urinary bladder or vagina which are conveniently located adjacent to it. But, a, but the uterus being a very thick and muscular organ, it provides a protective barrier of thought against invasion of either benign or even malignant disease. An interesting fact is that the thickness of the uterus makes it the last organ to putrefy post-mortem in the female body. Uterine layers can be identified separately up to 144 hours post-mortem. So what do we have in literature? There are very few other similar cases of colouterine fistula, uh, mostly secondary to diverticulitis, or in a, as a complication in known case of colorectal cancer. But in our case, it was the initial presentation. A colouterine fistula was first reported by Legentel in 1909. Fistula formation by colonic cancer occurs when a tumor extends or ruptures into an adjacent organ such as bladder, small bowel, or vagina. The diagnosis is easily made with clinical history and abdominal pelvic CT scan, which reveal the presence of gas collection within the uterine cavity. So we saw an interesting case, but what did we learn from it? Malignant invasion and fistulation usually take the path of least resistance, but malignancy does not spare even a resistant organ like uterus. Fecal vaginal discharge may be due to colouterine or colovaginal fistula. They can also present as passage of gas or pus per vaginum. The patient may not be able to differentiate of passage of gas or pus per vaginum or per rectum. It should be suspected in any patient with persistent vaginal discharge as well. Screening of colorectal as well as endometrial cancers should be encouraged to facilitate early diagnosis and treatment. I'd like to highlight the importance of screening programs. In a developing country like India, it is more so important to have good screening programs for the common cancers like breast, prostate, cervical cancers, or even oral cancers. As we know, early detection can uh, better the cure rates and reduce the morbidity as well, also reducing the burden on the health system. We have the availability of uh, screening modalities, be it radiological or biochemical, serological, and we know that effective screening programs are running in other parts of the world. What we need to do is educate and raise awareness, make these screening programs more accessible and affordable, include them in our health programs and actually implement them. And as we know, we radiologists form a big part of these implementation. Together, I hope we can and we should beat cancer. Thank you.